Hello and welcome to Bud's RPG Review, where I give my thoughts on role-playing games, card games and board games. Today's review is Liminal by Wordplay Games. Okay, first a bit of history. Successfully kickstarted in 2018 and released in 2019, Liminal is a game about the boundary between the modern-day UK and the hidden world, a place populated with secret societies of magicians, fairies, werewolves and ghosts that exists where the veil between the worlds is thin. It's available as a 286-page full-colour small-form hardback, PDF, and for a short period was available as a black-and-white hardback. To the cover. Here we have an appropriately creepy piece by Jason Benke that wraps around to the back, and there is something about the logo by Stephanie McAlee that I love that I can't quite put my finger on. Right, to the inside. We have the usual array of thank yous and content pages, and then move on to Chapter 1, Introduction. Here, we learn about the nature of the game, one of urban fantasy that draws inspiration from history and folklore, and that the players take the role of liminals, those that walk the edge of both the hidden and mundane worlds. We then move on to the hidden world itself. This is a place of the supernatural and magic that the general populace is oblivious to. Every so often, somebody will stumble into the hidden world, though what they find there can be overwhelming. There are those that don't really fit into either world, like werewolves and changelings, those touched by the Fae, who end up being nearer to ordinary mortals. In the Hidden World, magic is real and two societies dominate it. The Council of Merlin, those rich with tradition of formal magical training, and the Mercury Collegium, a band of tricksters and thieves. Vampires are real and are, as you may imagine, ageless drinkers of blood who are able to pass as human. They scheme in the background under an organisation called the Sodality of the Crown. Werewolves are real and form in loose gangs, with one of them called the Jaeger family, who are attempting to bring them together as one. The Fae are real and can appear as human, but can also be the kind of creature that lurks under a bridge. The Fae serve courts across the land that are ruled by nobles. These courts usually exist in Fae realms that are hard to reach and often have rivalries with other courts. The two most powerful Fae lords are the Queen of Hyde Park and the Winter King. In Liminal, ghosts are real, but mostly invisible, and there are the ghost realms that are the echoes of places gone by. The Church are aware of the existence of the Hidden World, and there is a group called the Order of St Bede that serves both the Anglican and Catholic denominations that protect the mundane world from the supernatural and keep it hidden. They regard magic as a sin. There's also an Islamic group, the Open Knot, who have similar aims to the Order of St Bede and are allies to them. In addition, there's the Department of the Police, P Division, who are aware of the hidden world, how to investigate it. Some of them are even magicians. It then poses the question, how hidden is the hidden world? The basic answer is that most people, generally adults, just don't think to look for it, and that it's hard to find anyway. The amount of ordinary people greatly outnumber the extraordinary, and magicians really do have good reason to keep quiet. Vampires look like humans until they strike, and werewolves also share that trait. Fae are masters of illusion, and can remain hidden in that way. Additionally, the existence of the hidden world is frankly too absurd for most people to believe, and the Order of St. Bede are masters of disinformation, calling out every real YouTube video as a fake, planting the seed of doubt. Fey domains and ghost realms are not of this world, but can be accessed from it should the correct place and time be observed. But there are also cracks in reality where the hidden world presses onto the mundane. This is followed by a section telling you what is in the book, and then we have some inspirational media for those wanting to get in the mood for Liminal, and then we move on to Chapter 2 character creation. PCs in the game are called liminals, and it's suggested that a character begin the game with a drive, something that means you get involved with both the hidden and mundane worlds. Things like to destroy vampires as they killed your family, or to prevent magic falling into the wrong hands. They then pick a focus, determined, tough, or magician. Determined characters are strong of will and can learn certain traits called determination talents. More on those in a bit. Tough characters are, well, just that, tough. They're resilient to physical harm and gain a bonus to endurance and can learn toughness talents. Magicians, as you might expect, know how to use magic. Shape changes and lycanthropes are listed as a magical style, though it only applies to shape-shifting for those that want to learn to change into more than one shape. Characters also have skills. These can be trained or natural abilities. Each character has skills with a level, a numerical value representing how good they are. Starting characters have 17 points to spend on skills with a cap of 4 points in a skill. Each point spent buys a level in a skill. Characters also have traits. These are special training on innate abilities that are different from skills and can give them bonuses. Supernatural abilities are traits, as well as those that enhance natural abilities. 
Magicians learn magical styles as traits. They cost one or two points each, and starting characters have five points to spend on them. In addition, some supernatural beings have limitations, things like a vulnerability to wood or sunlight. Characters can have up to two, and each limitation grants an extra point to spend on traits. Characters also have three attributes, endurance, will and damage. Endurance represents a character's physical limitations and is equal to eight plus the athletic skill. The tough focus gives an additional four endurance as a bonus. Will is a character's inner fortitude. This is a spendable resource that is used to boost dice rolls and empower magic. Supernatural effects drain Will. This is equal to 8 plus their conviction skill. The determined focus gives 2 additional points as a bonus. The damage attribute is a measurement of the potential physical harm they can do. It is measured as dice that vary plus a flat bonus. For example, an unarmed attack does d6 damage whereas an attack with a heavy firearm does d6 plus 4. Nastier weapons such as rocket launchers and grenades are not listed as they are not normally available in the UK and are assumed to kill if they hit. After this we move on to character concepts. Here it gives us some ready-built templates for players to use. Each concept has a list of suggested skills, traits, limitations and which focus is required. The first is the academic wizard, those who have been classically trained usually after completing an undergraduate degree. Potential students tend to be spotted by mentors and receive what could be considered a proper magical education. They're usually sponsored by the Council of Merlin and the most prestigious school is D College in Oxford. We then have the Changeling. These are the offspring of fey women and mortal men. They appear human, but usually have an unusual characteristic like mismatched eye colours or unusual skin markings. They have an instinct for magic, especially glamour, and most have magical vision known as the sight. Next is the clued up criminal. These are those attracted to the underground nature of the hidden world, who seek to use it for their own gain. The Mercury Collegium is regarded by most as consisting of criminals. After this we have the Dampir. These are vampires that have retained their humanity and are extremely rare. They're not dead, they still breathe and their heart still pumps blood. They have some vampire powers and a need to feed like vampires. They're usually partly controlled by their vampire creator. There's the Eldritch Scholar, those people from the mundane world whose studies have led them to the hidden world. These are fascinated by what they have discovered and seek to find more. We have the face, someone who is a diplomat that moves within the hidden world acting as a go-between for various factions. They have excellent social skills and are usually human rather than supernatural. There's the gutter mage, a wizard with no formal magical training. Some of them hate the intrinsic elite belief of the more traditional establishments and their magic can sometimes be more powerful than that of academics as they don't really worry about obeying the rules. Next is the investigator. This is most often a person from the mundane world who has chased down that particular lead to the point where they have discovered the hidden world, though what they do with the information they have is often hard to deal with. P Division is the exception to this as they investigate magical and supernatural crimes. There's the Knight. These are mortal agents of supernatural powers or factions, often from military backgrounds, but equally as likely to be lawyers, computer experts and the like. They don't have the vulnerabilities that those of supernatural heritage have, though they may have supernatural talents due to their allegiances. There's the Man in Black. These are clergymen from the Order of St. Bede who are charged with preserving mankind's ignorance to the supernatural. They have some magical skill and the title is not bound by gender. There's the Warden, a bodyguard to a magician, and in the Order of St. Bede they are considered equals to those they protect. And finally, there's the Werewolf, someone who has undergone the initiation ceremony to become a shape-changer. Occasionally a werewolf will be cast out of their gang and end up joining other groups who know about the hidden world. After this we move on to skills. As previously mentioned, starting characters start with a skill cap of 4 and have 17 points to spend. If a skill has a value of 3 or more, a player can spend 1 point to make that skill a speciality, which gives them plus 2 when using that skill. Skills are broadly grouped in 3 areas, physical, mental and social. Physical skills are what you would expect, things like athletics, stealth and melee, but also include those where physicality is a defining characteristic, things like survival and vehicles. Mental skills are those around knowledge and creativity, things like art, law and science. Social skills are just that, skills that deal with interaction with others. Things like charm, rhetoric and empathy, but also things like high society, which gives knowledge on how to act in aristocratic cultures such as fey courts and vampire society. We then move on to traits. These are grouped into five different disciplines. Exceptional abilities, determination talents, toughness talents, styles of magic and limitations. Here is where we add the colour to a character. Now I won't go through all of these, but pick out those that demonstrate some of the flavour of Liminal. There's the Agent of Raven's Tower trait, which makes the character a part of that faction and grants them some protection against harm from English Fae. 
for not Scottish, Welsh or Irish. There's animal sense, an intuition of what to do when dealing with animals and can even prevent them from attacking you. There's counter magic, a trait which allows the character to know defensive spells to disperse magical effects. We have night sight, which allows the character to see perfectly in the dark, and then presence, which gives the character a supernatural physical presence, whether that be beauty, voice or aura. There's the sight, the ability to see magic in all its forms, be that spells, magical or shape change creatures or illusions. Illusions cannot be seen through, but characters know they're there. After this we move on to determination talents. These include things like inspirational, which allows the character to donate up to two points of will to another character to help with a test. We have toughness talents, things like supernatural strength, which allows things like picking up a car. We then move on to the traits that are required for styles of magic. There is blessings and curses, the classic witch kind of thing. Divination, the classic reading cards, signs, etc. Geomancy, the art of attunement to places that tap power. Glamour, the art of illusion and sound. Necromancy, the art of speaking and interacting with the dead. Shape changer, that magic of shape shifting into animal form. Ward magic, the art of binding magical energy into objects and places to be discharged under specific conditions. And weathermonger, the magic of changing the weather. Moving on, we come to limitations. Things like Oathbound, where they can find it difficult to detect a lie, or vulnerability, where certain things cause dread to those suffering from the limitations. It briefly covers the money and equipment that players can start with, and then gives us a few pages of interesting sample characters, replete with their own portraits. Next, we move on to Chapter 3, Crews and Factions. In the middle, a group of player characters are known as a crew, and generally share a goal and think of each other as almost family. Factions are much larger than crews, and crews can serve factions by doing work that they either can't do or don't want to do. They essentially take on cases and advance their own goals, making friends and enemies along the way. There are a number of major factions in play. The Council of Merlin, an ancient wealthy group of wizards who seek to stop the wrong sort of people gaining power. The Court of the Queen of High Park, a hidden domain in the heart of London with a ruler that is a manipulative dealmaker. The Court of the Winter King, a less civilised ruler who has influence in wild and cold places. The Jaeger family, a werewolf nobility that are trying to extend their will to individual werewolf gangs. The Mercury Collegium, a group of thugs and 'er ne'er-do-wells who use magic to achieve their ends. The Order of St. Bede, a group dedicated to fighting the supernatural and protecting humanity from the hidden world. P Division, a specialist division of the UK police force that deals with crimes involving magic and supernatural creatures, and the Sodality of the Crown, a cabal of vampires that rule over most vampires in the UK, with their reach burrowing into government, the police and the military. After this, we go on to how you generate a crew. It looks into things that bind the characters together and their shared goals and what they are all ultimately working towards. It discusses the how and why they take on cases, including some suggestions to run with, things like it's just a job for them that they advertise in a discreet manner and even just basic altruism because it's simply the right thing to do. It talks about the assets that the crew have, including their base of operations, connections, equipment, hangers-on and even mentions geomantic nodes. More on that later. It goes into their relationships and hooks, talking about which factions are allies or enemies. The general idea is that the players and GM collaborate to create a list of factions that they are connected to. It recommends equal to or double the amount of players. The GM then writes a zero next to each of them and each player chooses two factions, a positive and a negative relationship. For each positive a plus one is added to the number or a minus one for a negative and they max out at plus three minus three. The final number indicates how the faction views the crew, with positive numbers meaning they are favourable and negative indicating dislike or even hostility. The hook is something each player comes up with that gets them involved in a case. Finally in this section, it gives us a few sample crews. Next we go into chapter 4, Game Rules. Liminal has a very simple core mechanic that is a target number that has to be met. This is known as the challenge level and involves rolling 2d6, adding your skill level and any bonuses due to traits. And if you equal or pass the challenge level, you're successful, below is a failure. If the challenge level is exceeded by 5 or more, it's a critical success which has an effect depending on what you are doing. For example, you accomplish what you are doing much quicker than anticipated. You perform the task subtly and don't attract attention, or you even just look really cool doing the task, impressing people nearby. Skills can be attempted without being knowledgeable in them, within reason. To do this, roll 2d6 and the challenge level is increased by 2. Failure can lead to further issues, such as immediate trouble or success, but it takes twice as long. On a roll of a double one, an additional complication is gained from the failure. The player can, however, spend will to raise the result. More on that in a bit. Characters can also assist someone with a task, if they roll a relevant skill at challenge level 8. Success gives a plus 2 to the person you are helping, and a critical grant to plus 4, though only one person can assist at a time. It then talks about how to keep track of time. 
The middle consists of a series of scenes that are dramatic in nature, and generally magic will usually last for a single scene, making duration fluid, and the implication is that this is designed in this manner to serve the narrative. It suggests a game of liminal should ideally last between two to four hours, and have downtime in between for characters to heal and deal with everyday life. We then move on to the use of will. Being a spendable resource, will can improve a role or test by spending will on a one-to-one basis. Some magic and traits require will being spent and some drain will. Once per session, a character can engage their drive, their reason for doing what they do. This will regain them D6 will instantly, up to their maximum. If we put them over, they gain an experience tick. In addition to this, will is regained in downtime at a rate of D6 per day of relaxation. After this is some of the ways to use skill tests. The first is social challenges. When attempting to get an NPC or PC to believe what they say or do, it is an opposed skill role with each action that they have done that contradict what they are saying, giving a minus one penalty to the role. Should they fail a role, they get a minus one penalty automatically on the next role with those people, and this is cumulative. The penalty can be removed by spending D6 will. Group tests are made with the GM going around the table and asking them which skill they are using to make the role succeed, with them having to explain why it's appropriate. They need a number of successes equal to the number of players taking part. A successful roll gives plus one to the number needed, and a critical a plus two. We then go into damage and healing. Physical damage is taken from the endurance score. There are two types of damage, minor and major. Minor is dangerous, but not usually deadly, and is d6 damage. Major is potentially fatal, and is 2d6. If combat ends with you having a positive endurance score, then your wounds are considered superficial and easily healed. Below zero, you're critically injured, and if you don't get first aid, you lose a further d6. If you drop to minus ten, you're dead. Will, as a resource, cannot go below zero. When zero is reached, the character cannot improve skill rolls or use magic. If something causes their will to drop below zero, then they are stunned for a number of rounds equal to the amount below zero. Healing is a medicine skill, a challenge level eight, or a ten if it's not safe and they don't have medical supplies. Success stabilises someone on zero, or causes those above zero to recover d6. Recovery from being below zero takes weeks and requires hospital treatment. Next, we move on to combat. At the start of the combat, it is an opposed awareness test against the most aware of the enemy. No awareness skill allows a roll with zero modifiers. In a round, you can do each of the following. Shout out, command, etc. Draw a weapon, load a gun or the like, move 30 paces and take an action. If you are the most aware, as per the previous test, you go first. Instead of taking an attack action, you can double move, make a social skill test or retrieve a weapon. The different ranges are close for hand-to-hand, near, i.e. within 30 paces, moderate, or around 60 paces, and far, which is 120 paces. You can, as you imagine, do hand-to-hand and ranged attacks, with both using the melee and shoot skills respectively. A critical success can either do an extra d6 damage, make you act first in the combat round as if you had won initiative, force an enemy to attack you first, or disarm an opponent. This takes an athletics roll of 12 to resist. If you don't take an attack action, you can just choose to defend yourself and make an athletics roll. If it is successful, a hit against you is half damage. A critical allows you to either take cover, retreat from the battlefield, or allow an ally to retreat from the battlefield. This is followed by a number of situational modifiers that offer penalties or bonuses of plus two to minus two. We have some simple rules on how mobs affect combat, and then we move on to character advancement. Characters have five experience boxes, and three advancement boxes on their character sheet. A tick is gained at the end of the game. If you either learn something new about the hidden world, advance your crew's goals, successfully conclude a case, or learn something significant about your crew or its members. You tick a box immediately if you roll two ones and fail a skill roll, and choose not to spend will to boost it, or use your drive to generate more will than you can use. When all five experience boxes are ticked, you tick an advancement box, and can raise a skill up to your skill cap maximum. When all three advancement boxes are ticked, you raise them and can either increase your skill cap by one, take a new one point trait, bank a point for a two point trait later on, or give your crew a new asset. New traits should suit the character, though GMs are encouraged to be positive about it. Once a character or crew has concluded their drives and goals, they can choose to retire, create new drives and goals, or add their character to the crew as an asset. The next section deals with magic. The first thing it deals with is blessings and curses. With this trait you can do just that. Blessings last for one scene and cost one will. They can give plus two to a single skill or attribute. A curse is a magical attack made with the law skill as an opposed test against the victim's conviction score, which also costs one will and causes d6 plus two damage to their will. If their will reaches zero, a specific curse takes effect, with some examples given here, things like they have bad luck or contract a deadly illness and die within a week. They can of course be removed with the counter magic trait or another magician with the blessings and curses trait, and it is opposed law test against the character who placed it. It also lists some additional traits that can be learned to enhance what you do, 
Things like Blessed Weapon, which allows a normal weapon to cut through magical and supernatural protections, and Hands of the Healer, that allows the character to heal someone by burning will points. Next, it covers Divination. These take time to prepare, usually an hour, and can take various forms like reading cards, imbibing special substances, astrology and the like. Two points of will are spent, a question is asked, and then a law roll is made. The divination will grant information about a person, place or object, but not from the past or future, just the present day. There are various challenge levels and will costs, depending on what you see listed here. There are also some additional traits you can pick up, such as foresight, object reading and scrying. After this we have geomancy the magic attunement related to geographical areas. Geomancers are tuned to their settings by wandering the landscape, observing the energy flows and landmarks and making magical sigils in various places which takes a day to perform. This attunes them to the area. When in an attuned area, they can draw power from the land to enhance their own reserves. When they spend will to boost a skill, they get plus two to the roll instead of plus one. They are also aware of the presence and rough location of huge magical effects, fey domain entrances and ghost realms in their area, as well as major damage to the land. There are a number of traits associated with geomancy, including Danger Sense, where you cannot be surprised in your attuned area, or Tap Power, which allows them to gain D6 will, which can only be done once except in the case of geomantic nodes. A geomantic node is a site where the energy flows in a particular way which allows more power that can go to the geomancer once per lunar month. Usually things like Neolithic stone circles, but it can also be iconic modern buildings. Tap Power can be combined with knowledge of wards in order to keep them active. The next type of magic discussed is that of glamour, the ability to create visual and auditory illusions. Most often associated with the Fey, it is known by mortal wizards, usually changelings. The strength of the illusion is correspondent to the amount of will spent. Illusions vanish when touched, as they are without substance. Trying to trick someone with an illusion is an opposed test versus art. There are some traits associated with glamour, like false face, which allows you to impersonate a person, or vanishing, which will literally make things invisible. This is followed by the art of necromancy, that magic associated with seeing beyond the veil of life. Practitioners of necromancy see ghosts perfectly normally, and they can be called and communicated with. As per other magic here, there are various traits such as exorcism, which is fairly self-explanatory, life-stealing, which allows the necromancer to drain the life from a subject, though this is forbidden by the Council of Merlin, and raising the dead, which essentially creates an obedient zombie. Shape-changing is given its own style of magic. There are two types of shape-changers, lycanthropes and magicians. Lycanthropes are those with the shape change trait that can shift between human and a single animal form by spending will, which grants them physical bonuses. Shape changing magicians can do more as they can learn more forms by buying extra forms by spending traits that are accumulated. We then move on to ward magic. This is the art of crafting traps and protection that can be placed on a person or place. Creating one takes around 10 minutes. There are varying types of wards, things like alarms, wards against supernatural beings and those that damage intruders. They usually last until triggered, though the creator can't recover the will spent to create it until it has been triggered. They can also be key to not trigger when a password is uttered. They are always visible and can be taken down by those that know counter magic or another ward wizard. They can also be placed on weapons and do an extra d6 plus 4 damage for a single attack. There are various traits such as crude but effective, which means the magician for an extra will can create a ward in a few seconds that only lasts until the next sunrise or sunset, and ward against evil, which stops undead or ghosts from getting near. The final magic detail is the weathermonger. This is the oldest form of magic and is control over the elements and weather. Weather effects cover an area of around a mile and last for these six hours. The more extreme the weather conditions, the more difficult and will draining they become. There are various interesting traits that weathermongers can use, such as core lightning, which does just that, and power of the land, which extends the range of weather effects to reach up to 100 miles. Next up is chapter 6, Supernatural Beings and Factions. Now there's far too much in the way of detail to discuss or I would be here all day, so I'll just touch on the main points. It goes into the Council of Merlin and gives a briefing of its history and organisation, including the rules that must be obeyed by the members. At over 1600 years old, it is very set in its ways, only allowing women as full members in recent years. Membership is very much based on prestige and wealth, though it obviously has a multitude of practical benefits, and the Council has influence in the sodality of the Crown and Fey Courts. It also gives us details of three members of the Council, Phineas Morgan, Augustus Gilbert and Professor Clementine Walters. After this it talks about the Fae. These ageless magical creatures have always been in the British Isles and their society mimics human society, albeit around 200 years out of date. They tend to live far from human civilization, and their culture is divided into various courts that are not fully of our world. These courts are ruled by an immortal noble lord or lady, with their character reflecting those who dwell there. Entering a Fae realm can be a challenge in and of itself, as they tend to be shrouded in illusion. Each entrance has a guardian that must be bypassed by various means, be that a fight or a challenge which could be difficult on its own. 
It then details some fey lords and ladies, such as the Queen of Hyde Park, who lives in a summery landscape of pavilions, lakes and parks. She and her court dress in garish Victorian garb, and although she has the airs of a benevolent ruler, she is just as dangerously fickle as other fey rulers. She is an enemy of the Winter King, who has a domain in the Scottish Highlands. He is served by giants, and his domain shifts location month to month, and sometimes pops up outside of Scotland. His face subjects do not like humanity, and hunt them on midwinter nights across the snow. It talks about river spirits, such as Father Thames and Mother Seven, and then moves on to the subject of ghosts. Having been around as long as people have, they are not actually souls, but rather an echo of someone who once lived. All death results in a ghost, however unless the death is traumatic, they fade away over a few weeks. Only those with the sight, those learned in necromancy, or extraordinary circumstances can see ghosts. They can haunt both places and people, and become more dangerous as they grow older. Magic mostly doesn't work on ghosts, so getting rid of them is hard, though persuading them to leave or finishing their unfinished business is usually the more prudent choice. Ghosts can also possess the dead and become reverence. Ghost realms echoes of places long gone, and entering one is usually a case of being in the right place and time, and the Council of Merlin has extensive records of them. Within one of these realms, ghosts are material and visible, and can be destroyed there, though they can harm mortals too. If someone stays in a ghost realm for too long, it will swallow them up and they will themselves become ghosts. Escaping them is difficult. After this we move on to the Mercury Collegium. These are a loose criminal network of magicians, supernatural creatures and in the no mortals who deal in forbidden magic and artefacts. They generally don't get on well with other factions and are enemies of P Division and the Order of St Bede. The sodality of the Crown wants to subjugate them whereas the Council of Merlin deem them lowly. They have the best relationship with the Fae and non jaeger family werewolves. The history is said to have been found in ancient Rome and Boudicca's rebellion and they also have links with the Hellfire Club though none of this is true. The Collegium was created to hide Catholic rebels who knew about the hidden world in Tudor times. Indeed, the gunpowder plot was an invention of the Collegium. These days, the Collegium doesn't really know whether to consider itself heroes or villains. This is followed by some prominent Collegium members, Abigail Nenge and Grant T. Leaf Warren, who despite appearing as an old man, is the deadliest assassin in the hidden world. This is followed by the Order of St. Bede. It is a Christian organisation whose first duty is to keep humanity safe from the supernatural and second duty to keep the hidden world secret. They regard magic as a sin, though will use it to achieve their ends. They are backed by the Anglican and Catholic churches, though most among these denominations are unaware of the existence of the order, and they are allied to the Open Knot, an umbrella organisation of Islamic fighters against the supernatural, and sometimes share intelligence with them. They differ in the sense that the order wants to keep the hidden world a secret, while the Open Knot wants it exposed in order to warn people of its dangers. The order dates back to a monk in Anglo-Saxon England. His work was unearthed by the Bishop of Durham in 1899, who, upon reading his works, reported it to the Vatican. Bede was made a Doctor of the Church in recognition of his work, but also to get hold of his writings. In subsequent years, the Order was formed and was a joint measure between Anglican and Catholic churches. It gives some information on the structure of the Order and the potential schism that looms. It details some prominent Order of St Bede members, Reverend Michael Gamble and Imogen Cooper. We then move on to P Division. This is a part of the UK police force that deals with paranormal events and crimes. The public is unaware of its existence, as are most within the police. All weird crimes are sent to P-Division. It was formed in 1947 by Chief Inspector George Carrington, who kept tabs on strange events. It gives information on the ranks of the police force, and how P-Division fits into this, and also gives us some prominent characters, Detective Chief Inspector Kayami Nelson and Detective Inspector Kira Singh. Next, it shifts to vampires and the sodality of the crown. In the middle, vampires are indeed immortal creatures that survive by drinking blood, as well as being schemers, manipulators and controllers, continually trying to outwit their competitors. They are strong, fast and hard, and can control mortals that drink their blood, and take pleasure in the suffering and sadness they create. Conversely, they are weakened or sometimes powerless in sunlight. Vampire society in the UK is ruled by the Sodality of the Crown, an organisation that goes back to Roman times, and they've recently shifted their core operations to Liverpool, having been burned out in London in 2015. Their main objective is to control the royal family and government. It talks about their cell organisation and how they gather in nests, and follows with a few vampire NPCs. Anton Dupont, a rogue vampire from revolutionary France, and Herawar the Wake, a dampier and Anglo-Saxon Norman who is almost a thousand years old. It also touches on the Queen's service, a vampire cell that is set up in the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Birmingham. It then moves on to werewolf gangs. Originally Saxon shape-shifting magicians, werewolves arrived with the Vikings and have been in the UK since. Unlike vampires, they are not ruled by an organisation, though the Jaeger family is trying to change this. Gangs have their own codes and traditions, and although some can be well-meaning, others are borderline psychopaths. They also do not view their state as a curse, with superior strength, healing, endurance being rather useful. 
It talks about the Jaeger family, who claim to be able to trace their lineage back to Anglo-Saxon times. However, this is completely fabricated, as they only started organising in the 1970s. They are rich and influential, which is unusual for werewolves. It talks about the Daughters of the Moon, a gang who roam on the Mendip Hills who are entirely female, and then it gives some details of some werewolf NPCs, Martin Jaeger and Shad. After this, it talks about the smaller factions. There's the Aldermen, magical gatekeepers that can facilitate crossing to ghost realms, fey domains, and even crossing between mundane locations. Their portals can be in mystical places such as standing stones, and mundane places like abandoned tube stations, and the price of their service is always two silver coins. Only a few dozen of them remain, their secrets stolen a long time ago. There is House Amwen, an ancient Welsh faction whose roots go back to Roman times, who are said to have taught Merlin himself. They are hyper-secretive, with many doubting they even exist, and there are fewer than 50 members left. They keep some of the 13 treasures of Britain in one of their hidden bases on the slopes of Mount Snowdon. These are powerful ancient artefacts that include treasures such as the Horn of Brangallad, the Mantle of Tego Irfon, and the Cauldron of Dirnwick the Giant. In addition to this, they have extensive knowledge of geomantic nodes that other factions are unaware of. The Council of Merlin believes House Amwen to be extinct. We then move on to the Flowers of Expression a community of artists in the hidden world, made up of mortals and liminals. Their goal is to create the most glorious art possible, with much of theirs being magical in nature. They date back to the 18th century, with William Blake being their founder. Blake was said to be gifted with powers of divination and the sight. They also count many musicians amongst their numbers, and the faction has no leaders, with respected artist opinions weighing more than others. The faction is the most diverse of any in the hidden world, and they never judge people on race, gender or sexuality, holding these views long before it was considered the norm. Even vampires are welcome among their ranks, as long as they behave themselves and produce art. In addition, no other faction considers them an enemy. The next minor faction is Raven's Tower, a group of magicians that date back to the time of William the Conqueror. They're allied with the Crown, and charge themselves with trying to keep the peace. They're an unofficial partner to the government who settles disputes with the Fae, who they maintain close ties with. It gives us an NPC from Raven's Tower, Malcolm Fleming, who hunts down rogue magicians in the name of the Crown. We then move on to the next chapter, Liminal Britain and Northern Ireland. This is an incomplete gazetteer of some of the more significant places in the UK with supernatural ties. As with the factions, I'll skim through this section rather than give away all the secrets. It covers the major cities such as Belfast, Carnarfon and Durham where the other of St B came from covers Glasgow and Liverpool, which is now the base for the sodality of the Crown, and whose famous liver birds are said to be supernatural guardians that can be called to help the city if it is ever under threat, though the ritual to do this has been forgotten. It goes into detail of London, which has incredible diversity, not only ethnically, but supernaturally so, with Jin, Rakshashas and Lugaroos joining the cast of characters. It is here that the Council of Merlin gathers at the Medeus Club, and it is also obviously the realm of the Queen of Hyde Park, and a place where the Mercury Collegium congregate in a pub called the Lion and Unicorn. It covers Manchester, or the Rainy City as it is known. In the John Ryland's Library there is a restricted section of occult books that belong to the Order of St Bede. It covers Oxford, which contains D College, where magicians are trained under the auspices of the Council of Merlin, and is the domain of Isis, a fey noble associated with the magic of dreams, memories and forgetfulness. It moves on to Winchester, which is formerly the headquarters of the Council of Merlin, and is the home of Winchester Cathedral, which is said to be haunted by the ghost of a limping monk. It moves on to York, an old picturesque city that was founded by the Romans and whose walls are said to be haunted by old soldiers. It is also the entrance to a ghost realm and houses the famous Goblin Market where wondrous things can be purchased with dreams, memories, talents or unique objects. It then moves on to towns and villages. Here it picks out some places of particular interest that are not part of the bigger cities. It covers the lake of Canudan a village that only has buses that run to it four times a year, and it is said to be the home of witches and magicians, and has ties with the witchfinder general Matthew Hopkins. It covers Glastonbury, a place linked to the legends of King Arthur, and Glastonbury Tor, an entrance to the fey realm Avalon, where the King of Summer resides. It covers Hinton St Mary's, a place with under 300 residents, that has a geomantic node that is guarded by a magical couple. The reason it is guarded is that it gives off a subtle aura that means that crime is non-existent here. It then moves to Peebles, a retreat in Scotland with a secret. There's a place where powerful people from the hidden world come to retire. They must swear on their power that they will never use it again to intervene in the world of mortals. Such luminaries as Titania the Fairy Queen and Mab, otherwise known as the Queen of Air and Darkness, live here. An important place of note is Port Marion, as a spirit called the Dragon lives here, maybe even one from the time of Arthurian legend, and the village itself was built to block an entrance to the ghost realm. 
It covers Saltaire, which has a nest of vampires in residence, and Tamworth, a market town that was the capital of Mercia that are said to be haunted by the ghosts of soldiers that died there. It then moves on to prominent locations. It covers Dartmoor, a piece of moorland in northern Devon, which is home to a nasty fake creature called a gremlin that love explosions and technology failing. It's also home to the Talbot Wormwolf family. There's the Forest of Dean, which contains the Puzzlewood, an ancient place where nobody can harm anyone else, and a cave that houses Aulus Marius Dentatus, who claims to be the first vampire in Britain and the ancestors of all who live here. He hides from his enemies in the Puzzlewood and is driven mad by hunger as he can't harm anyone here. It covers the Giant's Causeway, a formation of basalt columns that stretch from Northern Ireland to Scotland. Glencoe, which is haunted by the murdered victims of the Macdonald clan, and said to be the birthplace of the Bard Ossian, and Hadrian's Wall that is thick with ghosts. It has Loch Lomond, which contains an entrance to the fey domain of the Osprey Duke, and Mussenden Temple, which looks over the Atlantic Ocean and is adjoined to the ghost realm. It covers the New Forest, which is said to contain the ghost of William the Conqueror's successor, William Rufus. Stonehenge, a place of magic for thousands of years. And finally, Mount Snowdon, which is a base of House Amwen on its slopes. After this, we move on to Chapter 8, Being a Game Master. Contained here is seven pages with some of the most concise, practical advice for running a game I have ever read in all the years I've been a gamer, with the ideas here being applicable to most games I can think of. It gives insight to crew generation, people and places, new faces, adding to the world, information to build cases, the basic structure of a case, twists and how to vary challenges. Replace case with adventure or scenario and you can easily see how this can be done. It gives excellent advice on how to set challenge levels and how to deal with investigations and skill tests as well as things like internet and library research. It then goes into otherworldly places. It talks about how to create fey realms and how to govern challenges and the rules that apply there. For example, people always talking in rhyme or never using a word containing the letter E. It covers the creation of ghost realms including the frequency of them appearing and the attitude of inhabitants. This is followed by a short section on liminal outside the UK. Here it touches upon how the hidden world is everywhere and gives us some information on Berlin, where it discusses the magicians of the Rosicrucian Brotherhood and Fayetteville, North Carolina, and the vampire lord who lives here, the Duke of Portland. We then move on to Chapter 9, Many Faces. The first thing covered in this section is new traits. These are generally not recommended for PCs, and are all without a point cost. It contains things like appear human, immaterial, and supernatural bargain, by which one can trade anything between two parties, for example 10 years of life or all memories of a loved one. After this is a mini bestiary of creatures that players may encounter. First up is the Fey. We have the common Fey and the chaos causing gremlin. There are Fey monsters which covers the likes of trolls, ogres and giants, as well as rakshashas and kelpies and the like, and it also gives us the Fey noble and the changeling. We then have ghosts. It starts with the Echo, which is the least threatening, and there's the Material Spirit, the Vengeance-Seeking Revenant, the Shambling Spirit and the Caribbean Duppy, as well as something from British folklore, the Black Dog, which is a portent of ill omen. Finally, we have the Dragon-Shaped Nycor, of which it is believed that there is one trapped in Port Merion. We then have Clued Immortals. It gives us the Classically Trained Wizard, the Gutter Mage and the Knight. There's the Man in Black, the Monster Hunter, the typical P-Division Detective, and the Warden. After this we have ordinary mortals with the academic, doctor, journalist and the like, people that liminals may easily encounter. Then we have vampires, which covers the vampire fledgling, a newly made vampire, which also references the dampier. It covers the lesser vampire, the vampire lord and the servitor, and then we move on to werewolves. There's the werewolf irregular, the werewolf soldier and finally the pack alpha. After this is chapter 10, sample cases. The goblin market and the book of blood. I'm not going to spoil them here, but suffice to say they give an interesting introduction to the hidden world. The last section then includes some of the concept art and sketches, and finally there is a thank you from the author and a list of all the Kickstarter backers by tier. Liminal, as it seems with so many other great Kickstarters, passed me by when it was running, and only came to my attention when I saw how many people were talking about it on social media. During the COVID-19 lockdown period of 2020, I happened to chat with Dr. Michener on a number of occasions online, and he offered to send me a copy to review, to which I agreed, as it was a book I was considering buying. As many who subscribe to my channel know, I am a slow reader who also tries to be as thorough as I can with a game, so as to give anyone watching a true reflection of what lies behind the covers. And as such, while I was reading Liminal, I actually ended up playing online with Dr. Michener on a number of occasions, including him running a game of Liminal. I did feel that getting to know him over this period may colour my impression of the book, and to be fair, it did, but not in a detrimental way. While reading the book, I began to read it in Paul's voice, and I have to say that it helped bring the hidden world to life. Before I get into the system, I want to talk about the book itself. It's one of those rare cases where you can see where the money was spent. 
The art throughout is all relevant and at times achingly beautiful. The pages are glossy and subtly coloured and the whole thing has an elegance that you don't often see. The hidden world of Liminal has an embarrassment of riches with regard to the setting being in the British Isles, as the folklore lends itself so easily to what is trying to be accomplished. I've heard Liminal described as World of Darkness in the UK, and while I can see the comparison, I feel that Liminal has a very English reserve about it, the suits the setting, and the fact that mortals are actually fairly important and influential, it seems like it would make people more likely to want to play them, than making the obvious choice of some magical being from the hidden world. The factions are clever, and have a historical reach that beds them into the atmosphere well, and things like the Order of St. Bede and the Open Knot serve to make the game more combative in interesting ways, should that be a requirement. Magic is pulled in a clever way from folklore, and it's not all-powerful which makes a nice change. There's the sorcery witches, druids, and a particular interest as geomancy, as it can apply so easily to the modern world. The protagonists are well thought out and completely fit the surroundings, with many ideas and tales from days of yore being something of substance in the hidden world. I also feel that the treatment of ghosts and the differentiation between those that are simply an echo of times past to malevolent entities like Nikor is a nice touch. System-wise, it really couldn't be much easier with its 2d6 plus modifier to hit the target number mechanic, but there are a few subtleties to it that only reveal themselves while playing. There's an element of resource management, but I feel it is geared towards keeping the story moving along, which is no bad thing. Liminal is a game about player investment in their character. In a time where I feel some minimalist systems fall short, I feel that Liminal gets it just right, with the system purpose seeming to be in driving the story along, not hindering it. After finishing the book and taking some time to think about it, I've come to completely understand why people seem to have fallen in love with this very British urban fantasy setting. It's a game about creating lasting memories, with rules that are designed not to bog you down, and pretty much anything you can think of can be twisted to the hidden world and created into an exciting escapade to take your friends through. I give it a 9.5 out of 10. If you enjoyed this review, please make sure to hit the thumbs up, subscribe to my channel and check out my other videos. Also, if you're interested in buying this product, I'll put some links below. Lastly, if you like what I produce here, then maybe think about supporting me on Patreon. But out.